This is Coach Jason Ballard, and I'm a business wingman. Over the years, I've learned a lot from working in our family construction business, serving as a senior officer in the United States Air Force, and running 12 different organizations around the world. Many, many people helped me get to where I am today, and it's my mission in life to serve as a personal wingman to others. That's what this podcast is all about, providing knowledge, tools, resources and mentorship to help people soar to their highest altitude. Welcome back to the Soar Higher podcast. This is your host, Coach Jason Ballard. It's an honor to be with you today. We've got another great show in store for you. We've got an awesome guest who's a, is an expert in the subject we are going to cover today, a very important subject for all businesses, all entrepreneurs, all folks that are leaders making important decisions about the future of your business. Today, we're talking about how to level up your business and reach your growth goals by leveraging the media. Today, we have the privilege of having Mickey Kennedy on our show. Mickey is the founder and president of a company called E-Releases. It's a PR firm that helps businesses become known and visible through all types of different media outlets. Um, Leverages news wires that, that spreads throughout the media world to get you the best visibility possible to connect with your clients to the best of your ability to help you and your business. And so Mickey, welcome to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me. You bet. So Mickey, tell us a little bit about you and your company and your journey. Like how did you get to where you are today doing some great things for folks? Sure. So, uh, I guess around, uh, 26, 27 years ago, I was finishing up a uh, master's of fine arts degree in creative writing uh, with an emphasis in poetry. And my career plan was to uh, wait tables and write poetry in my downtime. And so after I graduated, I uh, spent a summer waiting tables and realized that being on your feet for eight to 10 hour shifts uh, was very taxing on your back and your knees. And also, I just felt, I don't know, just emotionally wasted at the end of a shift. And I wasn't reading and I wasn't writing. So I just felt like I needed to find a safe office job. And I got hired at a telecom research uh, startup in Washington, D.C. as employee number three. And because I had writing on my resume, they said, hey, you figure out press releases, uh, write them, send them to the media and uh, try to make that work for us. And so I did. uh, We were faxing at the time and I would send these out and we started getting picked up by the likes of The Economist, Financial Times, uh, Washington Post, uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal. And I just thought to myself that, wow, if you can figure this out and, you know, sort of work what uh, you have uh, and make it appealing to the media, you could really, you know, drive traffic, drive sales. Um, This is just a powerful tool for a small business. And uh, around that time, uh, a lot of the people I was faxing started to say, could you just email us releases in the future? And that's when a light bulb went off. And, you know, I said, uh, I could, you know, build a database of journalists and just email them. So um, I spent about a year uh, contacting journalists and building my database again on my uh, downtime, which wasn't very considerable when you're working at a startup. Uh-huh. Uh, but I, I did that. And about a year after that, I launched uh, e-releases with a database of uh, just over 10,000 journalists at the time. Oh, wow. And uh, I was just a matchmaker. I would take uh, a press release or write a press release for a client and send it to the journalist that I felt covered that beat. And uh, I, I did that for a few years. Um, PR Newswire reached out to me and said, hey, we like what you're doing. Uh, have you ever thought about offering a wire distribution for your clients? And I'm like, well, <laughs> my clients are small businesses, entrepreneurs. They're spending you know, two to $300 at the time with me. I really don't think they could afford a product like the uh, wire that charges $1,600 to go out nationally. And, uh, you know, rather than run away, uh, you know, they invited me up to meet them. 
I saw their editorial team, and one of the things they remarked is that uh, their their editorial team is there overnight. Not a big editorial team, but there are people there, and they don't do a lot. Uh, they have to be there in case there's breaking news or you know uh, you know an emergency, a recall, many different things like that, or just to get news to Asia. And so uh, they're there, but they have so much idle time. And I'm like, hey. Mm -hmm. Why, what if I took my releases, scheduled them by default for next business day, and you set them up overnight? Therefore, it wouldn't cost you additional labor. And so that's sort of what we did. Um, you know, and, and you know, now you can move a release through e-releases that goes out nationally through PR Newswire. And rather than pay $1,600, you pay, you know, something like a quarter of that. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that that's you know, been really exciting to be able to give uh, these businesses access to something that they normally couldn't afford uh, because, you know, spending that kind of money uh, for every type of press release that you're doing is, is really cost prohibitive for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, the leverage opportunity of being on a newswire uh, is, is just, you know, amazing. I did a release early in the pandemic um, for the dining bond initiative and, um, it was uh, a release that would have cost like three hundred and fifty dollars for a new customer. Uh, we did it for free for to help them out. Um, it was really something just to help restaurants that were closed uh, early in the pandemic, and uh, we quit counting at one hundred and fifty media pickups. Uh, all the major publications picked it up. Um, it's a case study on my website, uh, and uh, you know all the major publications picked it up. Many, many daily newspapers picked it up, uh, a lot of food trade publications, just all over. And it generated in excess of $10 million in revenue that went back into uh, restaurants, uh, you know, that were closed during the pandemic. And it was to help them. And so uh, it did extremely well. I think because it was really positive news at a time of uncertainty. You know, we were going home for two weeks to flatten the curve and we didn't know what was really next for us. We didn't feel like we were in a lot of power, but here was something you're like, Hey, I could nominate my local favorite restaurant and give them $50 that would be secured through sort of like a gift certificate arrangement. And I think that that's why it, it did so well, but it just shows that if you have the right message, uh, a newswire can really leverage and go extremely far, much farther than, you know, one-on-one -on -one pitching or anything else like that. What an incredible story. And, you know, thank you for sharing that and, and kind of walking people through that. You know, the pandemic was, was horrific for many, many businesses out there. And I think a lot of folks are still feeling the, the effects of that and really starting to bounce back from that. But for the folks out there that may not be, you know, media moguls, may not understand this, may not have never have used some of this stuff before, kind of break this down a little bit. Uh, and and what is it, and how does it work, and 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 who is it really meant for? Because I think a lot of people think, you know, ah, that, do I really need to be on some national, you know, thing? Do I really need to be on TV? I don't know where to small to be on the radio or on some national wire like like break that down for us a little bit what what are news wires how do they work and you know who are they for and just just kind of help us understand this from your perspective sure so uh news wires are largely uh syndicated distributors of content um a lot of people probably have heard or seen in their newspapers and other places wires like uh ap also known as Associated Press, uh, UPI, uh, Reuters. Uh, those mm. are publications that uh, write articles and uh, then they license them to newspapers and other types of publications. So they don't run press releases, they run articles that they've written and they own the copyright to, which they license to newspapers. Um, uh, you know, uh, press release newswires work very similar in that how they syndicate and move and transmit uh, content electronically, uh, but they're moving press releases. And uh, these aren't articles. Uh, these are uh, basically the building blocks for journalists to write articles. And the goal is to uh, send these press releases out and have uh, a journalist uh, see them in their feed and say, hey, this looks like a really interesting story. I want to write an article about that. And then they write the article about it. Okay. 
So when you see a like a news release, what what define that for folks? I mean, that could be different things for different people depending on your experience and and knowledge about this space. What is that? So uh, a press release is generally 400 to 600 words. It's an announcement written usually in the third person. Um, you might have a first person quote in it, usually company executive or, or someone like that. And uh, basically it's, you know, what you feel is newsworthy that you're announcing to the media. Um, it could be, you know, uh, during the pandemic, we did a lot of press releases about people pivoting. Um, hey, uh, you know, this we're still in business. This is how you can work with us. Um, hmm. You know, we, we you know we may not offer you know remote installations and setups of software, but we have some uh, video tutorials and we can do stuff over Zoom and you know just really communicating what's important uh, to your business and hopefully what the media would be receptive to. Um, you know. The types of things that, you know, get released every day are, uh, you know, uh, new product announcements or services, uh, you know, uh, a milestone like uh, you've won an award in your industry and you want to communicate that to the media uh, could be, uh, you know, something like uh, you're announcing usually publicly traded companies are always announcing, you know, financial information, like how their first quarter worked, or if they're, you know, they're announcing a, a layoff uh, that they're doing, just things that they want to communicate to the media. Uh, for small businesses, uh, it's generally not, you know, announcing big things like uh, earnings and uh, right. layoffs and things like that. But, you know, it could be, uh, you know, something like, uh, uh uh, I know, you know, something that you, that, you know, you're working on, like maybe you partnered with a particular company to solve a, a, an issue, or it could be, um, you know, taking version 3.0 that you've just launched of uh, existing product and talking about some of the new features that you have and perhaps having a use case study of someone who's uh, used those new features and what that has meant for their business. And that's a, a time when maybe getting a quote from them would be more beneficial than having a company quote within the press release. Uh, most of the press releases um, usually end with an about section. We call it the boilerplate. Those usually get recycled in every public, uh, every press release. So you generally see like a Microsoft announcement will have about Microsoft. And it's just, you know, a few sentences that it just gets used again and again, describing yeah. what Microsoft is, what their position is in the marketplace. Okay. Yeah, I've seen, you know, where people like they get different rounds of funding. If they're like a startup, you know, oh, they got their round you know, series A, series B, you know, usually when, when they get funded by somebody, that's, that's usually a, a, a good announcement or they partner with somebody or they get bought out by somebody uh, or they're doing some significant contribution to, you know, the community or, you know, the general public. And, 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 it, you know, it's kind of like a good news thing, a feel good thing and, sure. and obviously uh, promoting them as well. So, do these things get picked up and in in um, you know potentially be on the radio or TV or is it just only through the online media type sources or all of the above? It's all of the above. So uh, the types of places that you you might get picked up is of course uh, in in print uh, online. Uh, could be uh, industry trade publications. Uh, could be magazines, newspapers. Uh, as well as TV and radio. Uh, we've had uh, clients get picked up on Good Morning America, uh, The Tonight Show. Um, we, we had a client that does uh, celebrity rubber ducks called Celebra Ducks, and they've been on a couple of the late night shows uh, where they bring out customized ducks to give to a celebrity appearing that night. And it's just a lot of fun. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, it's all different types of places. I will say that, you know, TV and radio is a little bit harder, uh, to, to, to break into, especially radio. Cause it seems like a lot of radio has moved, uh, away from spotlighting businesses and, and, and products and services. And it's more about talk and, politics and controversy uh right. but but still there's you know uh tv's also you know still they're still doing uh you know 
uh, fun products and services on uh, shows like Good Morning America, like, you know, Kitchen Gadgets or Things Before Father's Day. So they're often still bringing products and services on and, and highlighting those. So that still remains a viable option. Uh, but I, I do th- I do think that uh, something we're seeing now is social media, uh, you know, mm-hmm. using press releases. Uh, there are, uh, for example, uh, uh, Instagram influencers who are really big into fashion and they're given uh, journalists access to the wires. Um, in the U.S., there's two large wires of press releases. There's Business Wire and PR Newswire. We work with PR Newswire. They're the oldest and largest wire. Um, and uh, there's a smaller wire out there called Globe Newswire. And there's a lot of companies out there with wire in their names that are, are vying for your attention, but they're not newswires or press releases. They're not syndicating press releases to journalists. A lot of them are driven by what we call syndication, where your press release gets replicated on websites. And that happens with anybody that you use. If you know when you send out a release through PR Newswire, the release will be on Yahoo, a section of Yahoo Finance. It'll be on a few little websites, the actual press release. But generally those places that they're at don't get a lot of traffic. What we're really looking for is a journalist to turn that press release into an article. And that only happens if you're on a real newswire or press releases that reaches journalists. And so, uh, you know, for that, for that reason, you want to make sure that you're sticking with the, one of the you know, major newswires and, and, and really getting your content out there widely. So, uh, you know, I, I, follow somebody on TikTok called Snackalator, who's an influencer. And he does a weekly roundup of snacks and weekly roundup of like fast food things. And almost all of his images, he says he pulls from press releases. Uh, so he's, he's someone who's looking at these releases uh, as companies are announcing new products, hitting shelves and things like that. And, uh, you know, that that's, you know, that's a great way in which th- this you know, this new form of media is opening up and allowing opportunities for companies to get wide exposure. And, you know, where we get news is evolving and changing. But the good news is, you know, the wires are evolving and giving access, uh, you know, to uh, influencers and other people, which is really, really, uh, I guess, exciting and a change. Because when I entered the market of news wires, you know, probably when I started working with Pyrenees where like 15 years ago, they were not welcoming to bloggers and, uh, they, Hmm. they, they really reluctantly finally allowed bloggers to have access. And now that, you know, I was shocked at the number of influencers that have journalists access to the wires. So I think that they've, they've recognized that the the old fashioned way of, of getting content and what is media has evolved. And, and I, I like that they're at the forefront now. Um, at the time uh, that I was uh, pitching a blogger to the wire because they came to me and said, Hey, Pierre Newswire is not giving me journalist access. Uh, and, and I just told him, I said, look, this, uh, this, this uh, person was in tech. They had more visitors to their website and blog than Computer Magazine had paid subscribers. And so I was just like, you know, I, I just said, this is a no brainer. You should be giving this person access. And eventually they did. But um, I, I think that, uh, you know, people are evolving and recognizing that, you know, uh, news is changing. Uh, newspapers are changing. Uh, I think social media is driving that. I think the progression to video uh, is also driving that. I think that there is completely a strong likelihood that in a, just a few years, um, you know, the concept of a video press release will not be a foreign thing that uh, yeah. the Newswire is trying to package and charge ten thousand dollars for. Uh, but. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, how we get our content is is exciting. How we get news is exciting. Uh, a lot of young people feel that they're getting their news from like Instagram and uh, TikTok. And I think that as long as uh, you know the people that are out there, you know, putting this content together have access to the the wire and press releases, it's going to remain a viable way to 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 reach the media. Yeah, fascinating world. Um, sounds like there's, there's a lot of science to this. There's a lot of layers to this. Like how long did it take you to, 
really understand it and really get good at this? <laughs> uh, 25 years, maybe. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I think that I, I, I have, uh, I, I came to it with the idea of what it could be, seeing how it worked so well for the company I was at, Telegeography. And I just, you know, uh, you know, felt like I needed to evangelize the opportunity. Um, you know, I, I, I challenge any great marketer to say, have you ever like spent $350 and generated more than $10 million in revenue? And I can't think of anyone that can probably say that they have, but you right. know, just that one case study that we did during the pandemic did that. And it sort of shows the wild extreme uh, opportunity that's there with me, with the media. It's not unusual for clients of mine to, you know, do a PR campaign, uh, which is like usually six to eight releases. And that's usually the best way to measure how PR is working is to measure the overall campaign. Cause you're going to have misses and you're going to have hits. Uh, and if you're, you know, uh, doing strategic types of releases, you're more likely to have hits than misses. Um, but, you know, all you need is like one really big hit for it to matter to you. I had one client come to me and said, hey, you know, that release we did, we only got one media pickup. It was a trade publication, but you're not going to believe the story. And uh, they engineer waste management facilities. They sort of try as a package deal. And uh, they said, uh, we're about to sign a deal uh, in Australia. Uh, we, you know, they'd never heard of us and they read about us in the trade publication. And uh, we're looking at like a 30 to $40 million facility that we're going to be building for them. And, you know, they said that, oh. uh, he said, I'm getting a lot of accolades at the company uh, for, uh, for, for, for this, for this deal. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it, it, it really is uh, amazing uh, the opportunity to, to sort of get out there within your industry, uh, with, you know, in front of uh, potential customers, uh, as well as your existing customers or your leads. Uh, I always tell people when you get media pickup, uh, you know, share it with your social media, share it with your newsletters, share it with your leads. There's always, I mean, what happens when people read an article is there's usually this third party corroboration that happens. It's like social proof. Uh, when a journalist writes about you. Uh, it's not like an ad. Uh, you know, I, I have people who come to me and say, hey, we got like 300 visitors from that article and it looks like half of them converted. Is that possible? And I'm like, yes, because, you know, when you read an article, not everyone's going to click through if there's a link, yep. but those that do are going to be really engaged and it's not unusual for them to just, you know, hit the buy button and, and buy. I, you know, many times I've read uh, an article or a blog post about a great, clever clicks, Kickstarter campaign, and then I immediately click through and go support it and and back that campaign and you know that's what happens you know when you have that credibility of someone reporting on you it, it really is like you know it, it's like this rapport and excitement is there that's not there with advertising and so yeah. uh if if you have you know that earned media that article you know put it in front of others and so you'll have leads that come up to you know the 49 percent uh, of the way that they're ready to work with you, but you haven't got them over 50% and they haven't converted, maybe getting that article in front of them and them reading it will get that goodwill uh, generated and that signal of trust will get them to you know, convert and do business with you. So it really is a great opportunity uh, you know, to, to establish yourself and to you know, use that um, credibility that's created through earned media and transfer that elsewhere. Let's talk about the process. You know, there there's a specific kind of, you know, just like anybody that, you know, listens to the podcast today, they're like, you know, oh, yeah, this sounds cool. I think I'll just go out and do this tomorrow, right? Like, like it's, that's, not, that's just not going to happen, right? There's a process to this. So for folks that may not be as familiar with, you know, uh, media and, releases and articles and getting, you know, themselves kind of shotgunned out there across all the major players that pick up these things, right? You know, like, like there are certain main kind of channels, you know, think of like an interstate system, right? There's some major thoroughfares, six, eight lanes of traffic where you can go really, really fast. 
Um, but then there's also offshoots, you know, the side streets that, that are off of that. You can, and, and that, that just kind of spreads in different communities, different towns, and it kind of leads you different ways, right? The way that I would summarize this, and you correct me if I'm wrong, Mickey, is that, you know, what you're providing is the super highway, right? The, where everybody's connected to it and everybody can see what's going on and they can also, if, if there's interest and that's, you know, worthy and, 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 you know, uh, something that they're, uh, interested in can take it and take it down all the back roads, take it down all the two lane, like, and this thing could just spread all over the place and really become, you know, viral or whatever you want to call it. Right. So <laughs> am I, is my analogy accurate or, or, or not? I think it is accurate. I think that, you know, not everyone goes viral, uh, but right. uh, there are people who get earned media that add, you know, they, they put in $5,000 of uh, effort into a PR campaign annually and they get like six figures plus annually and they're happy with that and they continue sometimes they'll have a huge home run and maybe it's two, three, four hundred thousand dollars but sometimes it's, it's it might be just you know a hundred thousand dollars but you know it, it's a really good conversion you know you put in under five five thousand and you, and you get six figures it it does take a bit work uh, a bit more right. work than creating an ad or hiring an you know an agency to do everything for you uh, there are PR firms that will, you know, do everything for you, they're generally pretty cost prohibitive. You know, usually yeah. if they start at, you know, five, seven, ten thousand dollars a month, usually a one year campaign. And what I do is I try to tell people that this is something that you can do yourself. It does it will take a little bit of time and effort, but not, you know, a, an unforeseeable amount. Um, yeah. I, I tell people to try to, you know, let's, you know, let look at a campaign of six to eight releases. Uh, maybe do them every other month or maybe quarterly. So it's manageable. And, you know, really your time and effort is should be spent on what your message is, you know, the strategy behind what you're announcing. Um, so many people spend their effort on trying to write the perfect press release. And the truth of the matter is, I have people who get picked up with mediocre press releases. The, the writing and perfection of it is not as important as what you're announcing. And this mm -hmm. is from a guy who's, who wrote a book 10 years ago about the beginner's guide to writing you know, the best press release. I used to think that writing the most perfect press release would give you an edge when it comes to getting media attention. And now I've learned it's not. It's what you're announcing. And yeah. so if you announce something that's really engaging and really interests the media, they will forgive the fact that, you know, it's not the, the you know, uh, written by Shakespeare or or perfect <laughs> or anything along those lines. And so, um, I, you know, my my. Uh, There's hope but, for everybody, right? I mean, any, any anybody can do this as long as you can put some words together that flow and there's a there's an exciting content in it that that's, you know, people are excited about. Um, talk about the process. So, you know, I'm a business owner. I've got a, you know, a business. It's a $100 million business. And I'm considering, you know, these types of services. How do you... When people come and 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 talk to you about these kind of things, you know, what do you do to kind of qualify them and 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 prepare them to see if they're even ready or they're a good candidate, the right kind of business to leverage this kind of capability? What's that process you take them through from you know beginning to, yep, you're you're in the system and we're putting out eight to ten releases over the national wires and you know see what happens. Walk us through that. So I think the biggest thing is are uh, are are they teachable? You know, can can they learn? Hmm. Uh, I I think that uh, I I you know I have a, a master class that's completely free that I I throw all my prospects and customers through, uh, and it's like a, a a one hour video where I go through the types of releases that I see every day get picked up, and. 
the problem is most people come to me and they've got a press release in hand and it's like, we just hired Phyllis. She's an associate in HR. And here's a press release announcing her, uh, you know, welcoming her to the company. And, you know, I'll take that and I'll send it and I'll charge you for it. But I also know that almost no one's going to cover it. At best, right. you're going to get a local paper and maybe a trade publication that puts a tiny little section on the move with, with Phyllis in it. And so what I like to do is to get people to go through this masterclass uh, where I talk about the releases that do get picked up and uh, what they should be looking out for so that when they come to me, they'll say, hey, here's a, a release that focuses on my story or, or my unique selling proposition. And in it, I've, you know, I'm authentic. Um, I've shared, you know, uh, some obstacles I've gone through. I've been vulnerable, uh, you know, uh, you know, th those types of things that the media resonates with journalists or storytellers and anything that you can give them that creates a story arc is going to be a huge advantage. And it's greatly going to increase your odds of getting media pickup. Uh, we get uh, product announcement press releases every day and they can be newsworthy. But often they're not. Often they're like, here's a new product and here's a list of features and things that they could immediately add that would enhance and increase their likelihood of getting picked up is a case study. You know, here's a client uh, that had this problem. Uh, here was uh, they used this new product that we had beta, beta tested it. These were the results. Here's a quote by them. Um, you know, here's some actual data and numbers about this problem in the industry, um, you know, pulling data uh, that's publicly available out there and putting it in your press release will definitely anchor it and definitely show the problem. So if you say, hey, you know, uh, closing sales is really difficult in my industry, you know, here's a service that we have or a product that makes it easier. You know, it doesn't sound as meaningful as saying 87% of new businesses in our industry fail in the first five years because they can't convert sales. It's like, whoa, I'm going to pay attention to that. And, mm. uh, you know, so, you know, getting that data that's out there publicly and putting it in there is going to give you an edge. You know, having that use case study is going to give you an edge. And those are the types of things that I go through in my master class. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, data is so uh, important that one of the things that I always tell people um, in my master class and in person is that uh, you know people come to me and say, Mickey, I've tried a few releases, they never worked, I never got pickup. I'm just like, well, would you like a press release that's guaranteed to get pickup? And uh, they're like, yeah. Uh, so do a survey within your industry. Uh, you know you know, brainstorm 16 meaningful questions that you could ask others in your industry that are timely right now. And what do I mean by that is like, you know, we talked about coming out of the pandemic. I know that workplaces are evolving. Some people don't want to come back to the office. Some people want to do a hybrid, you know, CEOs and presidents and executives are worried about culture. You know, these are questions you could be asking uh, in, in a survey. You could also be asking questions that, you know, uh, might be a trend economically. Like, are you uh, planning to spend less or more on your marketing over the next one quarter, two quarters? Um, you know, are you potentially, uh, you know, considering layoffs or are you struggling to hire people? You know, you know, really you know, brainstorm, ask coworkers, um, you know, if there's questions that you would ask colleagues at a conference, those potentially could be questions that you would want to put in a survey like this. Um, you know, look at trends that are going within your industry and, and just ask really meaningful, timely questions. Uh, and, you know, put that together, put that together. I like survey monkey at the end of it. You know, I like four questions per page, four pages. If someone stops halfway, you've got eight of their responses. So um, hopefully you put the most important questions first. At the end, you can put some oddball questions, left field questions. Uh, I've, I've occasionally had those work really well. Um, we had a client uh, mm -hmm. who was a auto local auto repair shop in Pennsylvania, and they came to me because their uh, SEO guy said, Mickey might be able to help you. And uh, they had a website that was tied to the yellow pages and that was their, their website. And when the yellow pages went goodbye, so did their website. They had a new website up. 
They weren't ranking at all when you were doing a search for them. And the SEO guy said, I, you know, it's going to take a while for me to get enough links for you to start establishing yourself. Uh, if you want high authority links, like links from automotive, uh, respectable websites, you know, uh, I think that uh, PR would be the way to go. And so I told him, I said, as a local auto shop, your only way to get links from auto trade publications is going to be doing a survey. And they're just like, who are we to do a survey? We're just a small little auto repair shop. And I just like, anybody can author a sur survey. And yeah. by being the author, you get to have quotes in there. You get to be the authority and the expert of that survey. And so we put together, you know, 16 questions. Um, the, on the last page, we just had an open field. What was the strangest thing someone left in a car while being repaired? We didn't expect that to be <laughs> the one that would go viral, but it did. And uh, they got picked up by, I think, over a dozen uh, auto trade publications, several newspapers, their local newspaper picked it up. Uh, I mean, it did really well. It was a fun article, not very statistically relevant. Sometimes that happens with surveys, yeah. uh, but it, it, it did really well. Uh, you know, they pushed back and like, we don't know anybody in the industry to send this survey to. I said, you don't need to. There are hundreds and perhaps even thousands of small and independent trade associations within every industry. Um, I, you know, I asked them if they participated in any, and they mentioned an independent auto repair trade association that they were associated with. I think it had around 1500 members. We just asked, you know, send an email, say, hey, would you consider sending this uh, survey link to your members in exchange? We will mention you and a press release we'll be issuing over the wire. Small and independent trade associations get almost no media attention. So a lot of them will see this as a win-win, a way for them to get mentioned in articles as well. Um, sometimes they'll ask, could we co-brand the survey? I don't see a downside to it if they're sort of, you know, twisting your arm to try and get a little more uh, right. exposure there. But, I, I you know, it, it, it really isn't that difficult. Uh, in their case, you know, they got a lot of media pickup. Within three months, they were ranking number one uh, in their area just to, because those uh, automotive trade publications have so much authority and it's automotive mm. specific that they just drove them up in the rankings. Uh, but, you know, I've had this work with lots of my clients, uh, most of them get uh, at the least we've ever seen is four original articles written from a survey. Uh, on average, it's eight to 14 uh, articles mm -hmm. that are written. Um, so it definitely works. And that's the one that I always tell people, if you're not feeling great about PR, you're feeling really reluctant, you've had, you know, a few losses, you know, try that one, because it, it, it has never failed uh, for anybody that I've worked with, uh, you know, doing doing the survey. And I think that it, you know, it, it really is a matter of uh, a journalist saying, Ooh, these are some interesting questions. I know that my audience would want to know the answers to these questions. So yeah, let's let's build an article around uh, this press release, and I think that that's why they do so well. Fascinating story, you know, of of just simple things. I think people want to overcomplicate things in the world all the time. I see this all the time as a business coach. People, you know, really overly complex their processes, overly complex their marketing. And, and really, sometimes the, the simple, most basic things really um, strike a chord. You know, it's, it's like watching the funniest home videos, right? You know, you get some kid on TV doing something goofy, and everybody loves it. That's the one everybody votes for, right? right. I, I, yesterday, I saw, I was watching uh, funny home videos with, with my family, and there was this one um, video and it had this this elderly lady look like a grandma. There was they were on this look like a farm. There was this little lake or whatever, and they were swing like zip lining across from one side to the other side. And the lady got kind of turned around on it and and got just over the bank on the other side and and fell off of the zip line it, you know it was a couple of feet she was you know right over ground at that point and bounced and rolled right into the into the water and got wet and it it was hilarious but just like the simplest most basic things sometimes just just hits um and, and we we just 
sometimes just don't even think about that. So they're really, really cool ideas there where a survey to some folks in your industry, clients you may have had, partners you may have working with, or just the associations or you may belong to, or people in your local chamber that you know and have met a few times, you know, be willing to take, you know, a 10, 15, 20 question survey that can get turned into some, you know, something really, really powerful. Uh, Really great idea. That's so easy. You know, a caveman should be able to figure out, but how many people are doing it? Probably not many, right? No, not a lot. And the, the sad thing is I still get these mediocre press releases from my clients despite me really trying to pitch that they should do more strategic types of releases. Yeah. And all I can do is, you know, keep, keep preaching what works and keep sharing uh, the types of things that, that people should be considering. Uh, you know, in the case of the survey, uh, I have one client who started doing survey about three years ago. Uh, uh, they represent about um, 30 or 40 verticals. And so they do a survey for most of these verticals annually, and uh, they routinely get picked up, uh, you know, a dozen articles, almost every press release. And it's like 30 uh, press releases they're doing a year. And now they're known as the survey people. And they just started it a few years ago as just like, let's give this a try. We've tried so many things uh, that didn't work. And now that's all they do. They only do these surveys uh, for the media pickup. They get the links, um, they get the traffic, um, they get the authority, and they're, they've established themselves as experts for all of these little verticals and niches. So how does this work, right? So we go to you, we talk to you, you you, you, you see if what we're doing is viable, you give your advice, you tee up a, a survey, you tee up an article, you tee up something that's newsworthy that you feel will get some attention out there. And let's say, you know, that works. Clearly what you do does work, right? And so, it, you know, you do an article for me, it gets put out there. And, and what kind of return on investment are you typically, on average, helping people get? Right. So <laughs> this is what's going to anger a lot of marketers. <laughs> it's hard to measure ROI with PR. The reason is you can put tracking URLs in your press release and journalists are just going to cut that off. Uh, you're going to have articles that get published with no link to your website. New York Times says that they do not link to any websites in their articles. I've had them do it once. But that was only once because we built a, a resource page and they did link to it. But uh, generally they don't. And, you know, and yet my client will say, hey, we just got picked up in uh, the Wall Street Journal. No link. But, uh, you know, this is the best month we've ever had. Sales are up 40 percent. We know it's probably because of the Wall Street Journal article. But, you know, it, it's hard to say because, you know, we don't have tracking URLs. We don't have the ability to track like we do uh, with other forms of media. So I do know that that's frustrating. Uh, you know, the, the types of things that, you know, a, a really good client will do is they will accept that we may not be able to measure everything. Uh, but, you, you know, we're just going to see if it feels like at the end of a PR campaign, we came out better than when we began. And, you know, are, are we, you know, are our sales converting higher? Are we getting better customers? Uh, you know, the ones that we can measure, uh, traffic coming from links to certain articles, you know, are, are people converting from those pages? Are we capturing leads? Are we asking people how they found out about us? And some of them are saying that I saw you in this article uh, that, and, you know, in this place and things like that. Um, you know, if you're dealing with sales over the phone uh, or chat, are you asking how did you find us or do you have a referral link of where they came from? You know, those are types of ways in which you can sort of try to recreate uh, some measurements in the place. But it, it really is in a lot of ways is one of those things that uh, is, is, is very, you know, difficult for a marketer to uh, truly understand because it, it, it really is difficult to measure. That being said, though, there are many startups that, you know, 
have no advertising budget, that don't start a Google ad campaign, don't start a Facebook ad campaign, and they just throw money at PR and they just grow at an exponential uh, rate. And they know that it's from word of mouth and PR and it's very synergistic and, you know, it's easy for them to, to measure. But for other people, it you know, it is going to be a little bit difficult. Uh, I do think that, you know, the people who do get earned media and they get lots of media pickup often see a bump in sales. Um, they often see their conversions growing when they share those uh, success stories with their leads, when they share those success stories with their social media and also their customers and put them in newsletters and on their website, um, they, they see additional leads being converted. They see, you know, uh, customers that would normally, you know, uh, shop around every three or four years to make sure they're with the right vendor. They're going to stay this year. So, you know, more retention this year than usual. Turn, churn goes down. So these are all things that I think you can measure, but it's not in a vacuum. You know, there, yeah. you know, it, it's not like you can just definitely say this is definitely because of PR. But I think if you start a PR campaign and that year you see those type of metrics where the earned media is there, you expose people to it, expose your clients to it, and your clients started to do better. Um, you know, it, it definitely uh, there's definitely a correlation or relationship. That's right. Well, you, you can measure things in a lot of different ways, right? I mean, you, you can, there, there's a lot of ways to measure this, right? If, if you know your data and you know what kinds of things you're doing, you know, your average, you know, conversions, you know, your average, uh, number of clients you're closing each month, each week, each whatever, and you know what all the things that you're doing and what that baseline is, which you should be tracking anyway. And there's a lot of analytics and Google things. Um, all the social media sites have analytics. Like there's many, many ways you can do that and triangulate in on, you know, hey, we did X things in, in, in the media and those things resulted in X number of articles and those, and, and that month we went from a baseline of $30,000 a month to $60,000 a month or whatever that may be. Right. right. So right. there's a lot of ways to, to track that and, and what have you. And, you know, I think another great point for folks here is this is not a ton of of money. I think most people spend more on social media. Most people spend more on Google ads and all this other stuff than they would on kind of the, 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 the approach of using media and leveraging, you know, uh, a, a hungry group of journalists out there, thousands and thousands of journalists that are connected to these major thoroughfares of of news and newsworthy things that are hungry for this stuff every single day and leveraging the power of those networks, the power of those things. And it's not, uh, you know, hugely expensive. This is not an ad on the Super Bowl. You know, we got the Super Bowl coming up here uh, next weekend and people think, oh my gosh, you know, Budweiser spent $8 million on 30 second ad to, <laughs> you know, sell more beer or whatever. Okay, great. That's not what this is. And so, you know, Mickey, as we kind of close up for today on this really great session, I feel like we just really scratched the surface in this conversation. What are the top couple of things you want to leave people with that you think is most important for them to take away? I think one of the biggest things is that so many people think that, hey, this is great, but I believe that PR is really you know, something that's for well-funded companies that are much bigger than me. And I think that what they don't realize is that journalists don't get patted on the back and get appreciation uh, from their readers for pointing out the latest Microsoft or Google product. It is the small uh, startups, the, the mom and pops that no one have heard of, uh, the tools and resources of a, a new company or uh, someone that, you know, a lot of people just don't know about that they get appreciation mm. for. They love being seen as curators and bringing these little discoveries to light. And those are what they often get accolades for. And for that reason, you are mm. much more likely to get media attention as a small business or an unknown business or a new business 
than you are uh, being a well-funded large company. They know that the well-funded yeah. companies can easily advertise. So why give them free space? Uh, you know, you do have to cover uh, the large companies uh, in some respect, but most of the uh, articles that highlight and spotlight new products and services are often around startups and smaller companies. So, you know, I know that there's this imposter syndrome with small businesses and you just got to get over it and be willing yeah. to get out there and and claim a little bit of this because it, it is there and available uh, for you and your size often can be an advantage. Yeah, no, that's a really great point um, because people like, the the rags to riches stories they like the rocky balboa story of you know some no-name guy that gets in the ring with some you know world heavyweight champion that's you know way out classism but yet you know but but can do it the underdog story of somebody that that was came from nothing and became something right you know they, they everybody loves those kind of stories everybody likes to see new innovative things and things that can really make a difference and, um, you know, really kind of connect on that personal level versus this big corporate, Hey, you know, Procter and Gamble came out with new line of toilet paper today. And it's like, really, it's, it's still toilet paper. But if you come up with a new way of, of solving some major issue out there in the world that's going to make the world a better place, a better way to clean the air, a better way to clean the water and, you know, reuse our energy sources to the betterment of, of everybody around you. You solve some major uh, problem out there and you're a smaller size company, man, they're, they're going to feed on that. They're going to love that because that's, that's, that's what America is. You know, we, we love that. So Mickey, thank you so much for all the great work you're doing to help people get them exposed, leverage these kind of hidden treasures that are out there for people they don't even really know about and really, you know, take their game to the next level. Really, I think what you do is game changing stuff. And so if people want to, you know, meet with you, talk with you, learn more, what's the best way for them to contact? You? Sure. So the website's ereleases.com. Uh, we're available on chat or by phone or email. Um, you'll only talk to an editor. We have no salespeople. Uh, and I do have a free masterclass. I think I mentioned it. Uh, I think yep. it's a great place for anybody new to PR or considering to start. Um, it's less than an hour long video and it'll allow you to do an audit of your business and probably walk away with half a dozen uh, strategic types of press releases you should uh, be considering so that when you do a PR campaign and you focus on those, you will have a, a much more likelihood of getting media pickup. And that's at ereleases.com slash plan, P-L-A-N. And again, it's completely free. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for, for offering that to help people. Um, Folks, that's it for today's session. I highly encourage you to connect with Mickey. He really, truly is just an overall great person, um, but also an expert in what he does. He's been doing it a long time, well over you know 20 years of industry experience here, knows exactly how to take you and what you do and magnify that on a level that you may or may not have even, even imagined, right? Next week, we've got a, an amazing, an amazing episode. Next week, we're going to be talking about how to turn roadblocks in your business into pathways, you know, creating new opportunities, uh, you know, turning lemons into lemonade. And so some of these things, like we learned today with Mickey and his work, people aren't even thinking about, they don't even know exist. These are ways that can absolutely be a game changer in your business, taking roadblocks and turning them into pathways. You won't want to miss it. Look forward to seeing you then. Have a great week, everybody.